Hello and thank you for joining today's event. Six at age five, past, present, and future. Questions from Matt Salganick and Chris Bale. Now I would like to introduce Nanette Coleman. Nanette is a PhD candidate in the sociology department at the University of California, Berkeley and UC National Lab Los Alamos Fellow. Her work sits at the intersection of the sociology of culture and organizations and focuses on cybersecurity, surveillance, and privacy in the U.S. context. Specifically, Nanette's research examines how organizations assess risk, make decisions, and respond to data breaches and organizational compliance with state, federal, and international privacy laws. Nanette holds a Master of Public Administration with a specialization in democracy, politics, and institutions from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and both an MA in Economics and a BA in Communication from the University of Buffalo SUNY. A non-traditional student, Nanette's prior professional experience includes local, state, and federal service, as well as work for two international organizations and two universities. Thank you. I'm also uh, the proud lead organizer of SIX Howard Mathematica, the first SIX to be held at a historically black university. I'm here today. We'll be discussing SIX, its origin story, the people behind it, Professor Chris Vale and Professor Matt Salganik, what they've learned after five years, two under pandemic conditions, and what they're doing to continue elongating the SIX table and making sure the people dining at it are as diverse as possible. How do we keep making this inclusive? I'll begin by introducing them both, and then we'll make our way through a few questions. Chris Bale is Professor of Sociology and Public Policy at Duke University. Matt Salganik is Professor of Sociology at Princeton University. So uh, I, I think before we kick off here, I, I just want to mention how I met you both. It, 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 you may not both remember, but you both came to Berkeley Colloquium at the same, at the same year, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it was office hours uh, with you, Matt, and then uh, after introduction from Ann Swidler, Chris, it was uh, coffee on Sproul Plaza. And I found you Actually, both to be, yes? I think it was a smoothie. Oh, it was! Yes, it was, it was a smoothie. smoothie. Yeah. And I, I mean, you paid. <laughs> you were like, I'm a professor. I'm like, okay. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, I remember at the time that you were both just incredibly accessible and, and, and kind. And, and as I think about, you know, alongside great writing, admittedly, my admiration for academics has a lot to do with that also. And you both continue to inspire and surprise me. So thank you for your counsel, uh, your mentorship, and your, your sponsorship. I know the larger six family really appreciates you. So let, let's jump straight in. Uh, so for the, those that are, are, are new to six, can you tell us uh, a little bit about what the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science or six is? And I would actually like to know how you both met and decided to do this. Uh, so that's a piece of the story I actually don't know. Now you want you want to get us started? Sure, sure. Uh, so six is a summer training program for uh, graduate students, postdocs, and junior faculty who are interested in computational social science. It's for both people who think of themselves as social scientists and people who think of themselves as data scientists, because we think computational social science is an interdisciplinary community, and it works the best when we have contributions from people with many different kinds of backgrounds. And one of the things we try to do a lot at SIX is create opportunities for the participants to learn from each other. And so Chris can tell the the origin story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, without getting too much into the weeds, we um, we were introduced by an interesting organization called the Russell Sage Foundation, mm. which is the only philanthropy in the U.S. with the express mission of using social science to improve social conditions in the U.S. So to work on inequality issues in the U.S. And Matt and I kind of had friends of friends, but had never really met each other. And um, the president of the organization got us both together at, at a conference and said, hey, wouldn't you love to do this? And both of us, I think, were kind of like, well, how do you do this? What is this? You know, what is a <laughs> summer institute? And they gave us some interesting examples of past um, programs. For example, there was one in economics, behavioral economics. There was one in um, social genomics. And um, they said, hey, we think there's a lot of need out there for people to learn how to do ethical, responsible social science that will improve the social condition. What do you think? 
And, um, you know, we, uh, I think we both were a little scared to start a new program um, from scratch and, and especially in a field that's so diverse as ours and that's growing so rapidly. And even, you know, being able to say what is computational social science back then and even now is still really hard to do. So um, we kind of both dove in and uh, five years later, here we are. So uh, after five years, I'd, I'd love to know um, what you've learned about how people find their way to computational social science, because there has to be so many different paths. Um, and, and also, I'd, I'd love to know a, a little bit about the common struggles and fears and things that you see amongst people who choose uh, to sort of dive into this, this innovative and just in, in incredible method and field. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I can take a stab at that one, um, and I'm sure Matt has something to say too. Um, you know, we we both I think came came through um, undergrad and graduate school at a time when this term computational social science didn't exist, mm -hmm. and you know, um, I think most people were learning in really imperfect ways. You know, learning from you know. Uh, a friend over coffee, learning from uh, uh, the internet, you know, learning from um, really piecing together little parts of a, what, you know, what I think is like a much bigger uh, field, which, you know, uses principles from computer science, stats, engineering to, to study social science questions like, you know, um, how can we stop the spread of pandemics or, or how do we deal with, you know, um, you know, how, how can we uh, see where social unrest um, happens and what the drivers of social unrest happen and, and how can we, again, create a more equal and just society? And um, so, you know, I think there really wasn't a curriculum. And, you know, one of the greatest uh, things I think Matt has done uh, for, the, for the field, if I can just, you know, toot my friend's horn for a moment, is to produce the first book bit by bit. Um, which um, really tried to, you know, draw some bounds, there it is, draw some boundaries around the field, but also, you know, do a lot of really good, like, I might even call it like evangelism. I don't think you'd like that word, Matt, but like, <laughs> you know, reaching out beyond say sociology. So we're both sociologists, but I think we're both, you know, weird sociologists and that we like to think with people outside of sociology and we really like and think, you know, the future of the field probably depends on it. Mm. And so, um, you know, I think that was a great example of 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 something that that, that you know created the space uh, for a field to happen. And of course, there were other efforts. And you know, some people would trace the history of this field all the way back to the 1980s. But really, computational social science as we know it today really wasn't a thing when we were when we were coming through grad school. And I think for us, it was like, well, let's make something that will make it easier for for others to get these skills. Yeah, I want to pick up on a couple of themes that Chris brought up is <clears throat> one, uh, we did find that, you know, students at our own university were struggling to get this kind of training. And then we saw students at other universities were struggling a lot. So we just wanted to make this these ideas more accessible to people. And then we found that people come to it actually from a lot of different ways. Sometimes people come because they're interested in a specific problem. So maybe they're interested in political polarization, but the way that you study political polarization now probably involves digital trace data. Sometimes people come to it just through the data itself. Like people say, oh, wow, this is so neat. Like I can get access to all of these conversations happening on Twitter. I wonder what I could do with that. Um, sometimes we see people come with a method first. So someone says, I know a lot about machine learning and I'm interested in doing stuff to help social, help advance, help improve society. What should I be doing? And so all of these different ways into the community are, are great and welcome. And I think anyone who has any kind of motivation like that would benefit and enjoy from participating in SIX. I, I just finished off, uh, I think it's chapter six uh, of your book, Matt. I'm, I'm reading it with some undergrads of, of mine. And I think you mentioned the different entry points that people have. And, and one we also talked about is sometimes you find just a really cool website that, that's doing something. You're like, oh my gosh, it would be really great to use, what is it, a city photo or photo city mm -hmm. uh, that I can imagine using that. And, and, you know, and how do I do this? And how do I even begin to understand how to do that? So uh, fantastic. Uh, so shifting over to thinking about this uh, from the, the lens of, of, of the site that I'm helping to found and lead, the Howard Six Mathematica site, 
Uh, what are some common barriers do you think that groups might have in, in entering into this field? So, you know, we're, we're trying to be in, in thoughtful about that this summer, and the focus of our site is uh, anti-black racism and, and also inequity. So, you know, as we're, as we're looking at, at things like, um, uh, like COVID-19 or incarceration, um, you know, and, and applying that lens and that thoughtfulness, we also want to think about what are barriers to even getting people to apply to our site. Um, so I, I'm, I'm wondering um, what you all have seen uh, over the over five years uh, about what the common things are that, that prevent people from even being able to jump in to this work and what we yeah, can do to sort of fix that. First, let me say, and I know Matt feels the same way, how excited we are that you are all doing this and so grateful to you, Nanette, for, for leading this. This is a huge amount of work and we are so excited to see our first site at a historically black college university. Um, and you're right though, there's challenges, right? There's, there's challenges anywhere, frankly. And we, you know, we've now, we've had the, the good fortune to run these sites, um, not just at really elite universities in the United States, but in other countries. Um, and in, um, in parts of the world where there's even less access to, you know, the tools of the trade, you know, um, high quality technology, um, and there isn't any course in any department in a university on this stuff. So, yeah, one thing is, you know, how, you know, how can we break down these types of barriers? And I think one of the cool things that we've stressed from the beginning, um, is that anytime you build a new field, you can try to build in protection against inequality. You can try to do things in a way that will kind of effectively like hit reset and say like, how can we maximize the diversity in the, in this program? And from the very beginning, we've tried to do this along, you know, a lot of different um, social divisions, um, you know, ranging from um, all sorts of different demographic factors, but also international factors. And, you know, I would say, we are so much better for it. You know, already the type of research that's been done, the number of people we can reach, because, you know, what we want is to teach the teachers. We want to seed a new generation of people who will go out and, and um, teach this to others. So, you know, mm -hmm. and we want, we want um, again, as Matt said, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to make these, these skills easier to get. So, you know, the more that we can um, diversify the teachers, the better. Um, and so, you know, we, we really, um, this is one of our core values and that's why we're so excited that you're doing this. I want to talk about, um, <clears throat> another, I guess, pick up on the theme of barriers. So I think one barrier that we've seen, uh, is sometimes people might not feel like they are a computational social scientist. And so they can't come if they're not already doing computational social science. So I think Chris and I want to be very clear that everyone is welcome. Uh, if you're interested in learning this material, come and participate and you'll learn a lot uh, and you'll enjoy it. Um, so first is just making it clear to everyone that they're welcome to participate. A second thing that we learned over time actually is that participants vary a lot in the training that they've received before the Summer Institute. And so we saw this in our first year that uh, people showed up at different levels and that made some some of the collaboration that happens at six a little bit more difficult. And so we've also now developed, and I want to emphasize especially what Chris has done with his new boot camp, a mm -hmm. bunch of materials that people can do before they arrive at six. And so we want to make sure that everyone shows up ready to learn and participate. And so if you go through the materials that that we provide, you will show up ready to participate and ready to learn. And I want to emphasize Chris has produced an excellent series of videos, Six Bootcamp, which provides a basic introduction to R and some basic R programming skills so that you will show up and you'll be ready to participate. And I think it's also important to remember that once people arrive, they have ongoing support from teaching assistants, both at the main site uh, and, and also, and also uh, from both of you. So I definitely arrived with a healthy dose of anxiety at, uh, at Princeton from Berkeley. And, uh, and I, I, I found that there were ample ways uh, to, to get support if I needed it, both during and, and post. Uh, and uh, and I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great space uh, for students, whether anxious or not, to learn to learn the skill set, and something we're taking into account when we think about 
the Six Howard Mathematica site is also the role that imposter syndrome um, or, or you know, just feelings of, of belonging or structural inequality might also affect how students enter that space. Uh, and we actually have some things planned uh, for the two days before to help our students uh, get connected and 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 shake off a little bit of that too. So I know I I needed that. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> I want to you know. <laughs> I want to emphasize too that I, I I think most people feel that way, and I want to kind of normalize that anxiety because like you know this is a field which historically has not been good at letting people in, right? There's a lot of insider knowledge, domain knowledge, lingo, vernacular, you know, things that you might try to do on your own and, and it's difficult. And you might think that's because it's, you know, your own failing when really it's that the field isn't good at making these things open. So, you know, if you are feeling anxious, like I was in your shoes one day, Nanette, and I know um, many others will be, despite all of our efforts, right? We're, we're, we're constantly trying to improve, but, you know, anxiety is normal. Absolutely. And I, I, I want to, I want to add one thing about this also, which is that the fact that the other participants know different things than you is actually really exciting, right? So when we first started six, uh, I was amazed at how much the participants knew already. And I was like, oh, Chris, <laughs> they are like, what do we have to teach these people? I know, they're going to be teaching us, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, you know what, this is great. Like, there are people here who know more than me about lots of the things we're talking about. And so this is a great chance for me to learn. And so over time, six has become a great chance for me to learn. And so I hope that uh, in addition to feeling like it's normal to, um, to feel like other people know more than you, I also would encourage you to think it's an opportunity to learn from them. And we try to set up a lot of different environments at six for to build community and so that we can learn from each other, not just from the instructors. And also, I, I just want to tag on there. You know, we, we tend to think of this as like a hierarchy of how good are you at coding? Like how much mm -hmm. do you know about math, right? Like that's one way to define skills, but another way is social science, right? And and a lot of a lot of the most skilled people who say, you know, you know, come from the fanciest lab that does some the latest kind of machine learning, language kind, latest kind of natural language processing, whatever. They may know very, very little about theories of human behavior, or they mm. may just know very little about the types of problems that actually need to be solved in the world. And so, you know, the thing that's been brilliant from my view is like everyone has brought something, everyone over years and years and years. And so that's really the strength of this program, you know, is we, we um, and we know, you know, like, you know, look at the news, like, you know, do we need to be more aware of social inequality in, in machine learning and, and AI? Absolutely. I mean, that's clear as day. So, you know, the, these are the questions that companies, governments, and, and, and nonprofits are grappling with on the ground. So we need people coming from, from both perspectives and in order to, you know, to address these complex challenges. Yeah, the most uh, recent issue of science uh, has data and policing on the cover. And I, I, I know that uh, that issue is definitely gonna inform our, our location. I would also add that I, I love that that uh, one of the foundations of this work is is ongoing learning. I think there are so many folks that you know, and thoughtlessly so, think you get to a certain role, lay, level as a professor and you're just teaching. But my favorite professor from college still takes classes. He's a full professor emeritus. He still sits in on classes, and I I, I love that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about mentoring. So a big part of why I ended up applying is I I met you both. You were, you were human beings, uh, and I also got a nice foot in my back from Rochelle Terman. Also, I took uh, PS 139 at Berkeley from her, and you know, and she regularly nudged me and said, you know as much as everybody else. Why do you think you don't know it? And I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on, you know, because there are people who are in their, in their basement coding in the 80s, and, and I'm, you know. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how mentoring has been important to you and how you think about mentoring? Because I have definitely felt that from both of you. Uh, so how that fits into six. Matt, you want to take this one? Sure. I think uh, one of the things I think we try to create a lot is community. And so I think we think about in this. Uh, so, for example, we have different activities around lunchtime so people can eat together on topics of their choice. Chris has this very creative way of uh, research speed dating to get people to work on group <laughs> projects together. The whole second half of almost all of all of six is working together with other people and building those connections. And that's, I think, a big part of it. And so I think some example of the mentorship 
comes from your peers, right? Because that's the, one of the great things about six that you can't get just from reading a book or watching a video is you can't get that community. Um, and so we think that community is really important. We, Chris and I are both a part of that community, mm -hmm. but we realize we're just a small part of that community. And um, so over time, we've tried to nurture that community. We, the local site leader often plays a role in helping people, um, one, if they're stuck on things, um, which is great. Also, if they have things that they want to do beyond what we learn about, they can ask. I've also found that um, we often had people who wanted to talk to another professor not in their department. So, for example, someone said to me, I can't talk about this with anyone in my department, but I have this <laughs> kind of issue. What do you think should happen? So we can provide kind of all of these kind of uh, a, there's lots of people in the community who can contribute and help and give people a fresh ear uh, to, you know, bounce their problems off of and work together. Yeah, I, I just to just to dovetail with with what Matt said, like, I think both of us feel a little uncomfortable any anytime someone calls us like leaders of this, because I think mm -hmm. one of the things that we're most proud of is how much other people have taken this and, and done brilliant things with it, you know, like, uh, created new parts of the curriculum have, you know, tailored the curriculum to new types of audiences, just like you're doing then, which, which is, which is, you know, uh, a huge amount of work. And, um, you know, so I, I wouldn't want to take any credit for the way that, you know, this thing has grown beyond getting people in the same room, which I still remember, Matt, you know, that first year, we were just so thrilled to see everybody, you know, it's like all we had done <laughs> is put them in the same room and then everybody was off, you know, doing research and planning sites next year it was it was really you know like i, I feel like we were really more catalysts than, than mentors so um you know but but certainly you know whenever we can um these type of informal and th this intense you know being around each other for a whole week you know you really do get to 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 you know have some some deeper conversations and mm -hmm. and we have you know i think been able to 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 give some mentorship here and there but these lateral connections that you make too right because like you know, Matt and I are going to be old dinosaurs in like five years, you know? Um, <laughs> that means I am too. That means right. I am too. So don't say that. Yeah, exactly. Speak for yourself. <laughs> but no, but what I mean is we all need to learn, you know, we, we need to learn from mm. each other, you know? So when Matt was saying earlier that, you know, he's, you know, some of our, you know, some of our alumni are now teaching, you know, uh, or have been visiting lectures or at, at our site or other sites. And that's some, something we're, we're most proud of. I, I just want to add in on with uh, just excited about having everyone in the room. No one has ever been in a room with Matt at six and not realized how excited he is. It, he just, it just <laughs> emanates excitement. He cannot control the excitement. <laughs> so can, can you both talk a little bit about things that have grown out of six? So I know that there's, um, there's a, a site where you can find diverse speakers on this topic. There have been discussions about curriculum. Those are the ones that I know about. And I know, but I also know products and initiatives initiatives and papers. Can you, can you talk about the things that have, um, that have, have grown from six? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, certainly some, some great top-notch research. So, you know, Wired Magazine just profiled a study that was started at 2018 at the Duke site on gender and AI, um, revealing some pretty stunning discrimination from the world's largest, you know, uh, image recognition APIs. Um, we've had other work appear in like really prominent journals on, on topics like political polarization, social psychology. But I think like what's really cool is of the examples you just you just mentioned, um, you know, only some of them are research, right? Like others are tools. Um, others are like, for example, very CSS, V-A-R-Y CSS is this initiative created by two of our alums from um, 2018. Um, uh, that was designed to increase the representation of underrepresented groups in computational social science. And they created uh, a database, which is, you know, it, uh, you know, on the face of it is it seems like a, a simple thing to do, but I can't tell you how many times I've shared that website with mm -hmm. people, um, you know, who want to, you know, I, I, you know, increase representation of underrepresented groups um, on conferences and speaking and even just reach research collaborators. Or, or in hiring, you know. So, so those are collective goods that I that I think are just wonderful examples. Um, we also have, you know, software packages and other online tools that people are using in their research. 
I want to emphasize two more things that I think have come out of six. Uh, the first is all of the teaching materials that we've created. Mm -hmm. So those are all available open source. Anyone is uh, able to go through and do them in a self-directed way. And you're also able to take and use them in your teaching. We would love that. So we know more than anyone that teaching computational social services is hard and time consuming. <laughs> And so anything that we can do to make that easier, we're really excited about. So that's one thing that I think that's come out of six that's been really great. And we're super happy that, as Chris has talked about, like teaching the teachers, many of the um, students from our first program in 2017, they're now professors and they're now teaching computational social science, which is great. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention that I think we've created is this community. Like there mm -hmm. are now people who think of themselves as a member of the six community. We've trained hundreds of 600 people, maybe around the world. I think it's uh, over 700 yeah, Chris, now. Chris yeah. knows the number. So <laughs> hundreds of people who, you know, some of them in six in Cape Town, South Africa, some mm -hmm. participated in Istanbul, some participated in Helsinki, some participated at Duke or Princeton or UCLA. Uh, Chicago, all over. And I think they all think of themselves as being in one community. And I think that ultimately may be the biggest thing that we've created out of six. So I'd, I'd, I'd love to know uh, who in the field impresses you right now. What's, what's, where are you seeing some interesting ha things happen? Maybe some, some papers that um, you've read, uh, either, either from six, folks from six or elsewhere. Who are you reading um, that, uh, that has your attention? Besides each other, of course. Yeah. <laughs> which which reminds me, oh, Chris, I of course answer. have I your I of Matt, course so. have your your fringe effect paper here also, <laughs> which was my first introduction to your work. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I mean, I, I I can start a little bit. I mean, you know, there's so much data. You know, one of the one of the challenges when we get to the phase of this program of doing research, it's like, you know, there's so many different ways you could go. You know, when 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 we were in graduate school. You know, I would I would conservatively estimate, you know, 80% of people were doing research with one of like four or five data sets, you know, that we use a lot in social science, like the general social survey or the PSID, you know, some that, that, that tracks um, wealth inequality, right? And, uh, you know, then all of a sudden, anybody can make their own data set, you know, that's like unheard of, uh, you know, as recently as like 10, 15 years ago. So that simple, you know, diversification of the the tools and methods of science is is, is enormous and there's so there's just potential everywhere so it's kind of hard to, to to for me to pinpoint one thing but i guess i'll say i'm really excited right now about uh some of the latest advances in natural language processing um mm -hmm. you know so we're getting to the point where um uh two new tools like uh, there's a tool now called G gpt3 um which is a uh basically a tool that can learn from some language it can recognize patterns in language and then create language of its own um, language that is so stunningly human that it can now pass pretty reliably the turing test the test of whether people can distinguish artificial intelligence from human intelligence and obviously you know that there's all sorts of problems with this right we you know this in the wrong hands can go you know can go to really really bad places and you know we saw some of this unfold with the deep fake technology around image and video over the last few years. Um, but, you know, I also think, so we need to be careful and we need to think through the ethics and that itself is exciting to me, but, um, or it's, it's exciting and scary, but also really important, right? We need people to do that, that work, but then also like, how can we use this for research? You know, how can we, you know, so we can learn patterns that say radicalize people. Could we learn patterns of persuasive texts that could say, counter racism that could counter sexism could we use these tools in a research setting um, to create more uh, to create synthetic um, you know interactions between people say in the context of a survey um, you know I think this is like you know we're, we're still we're going to be figuring out all these things for years but I think you know the sooner we we can begin to wrap our head around how to use this you know and, and I think I think Matt might agree that you know, it takes a, a bit of creativity to figure out when all these new tools are, are all over the place, like how do you put them all together to, mm. to answer a real question in social science? And that's that's a challenge. You know, we can do a lot of parlor tricks with AI and, and you know, um, and, you know, and impress people at the margins. But at the end, we really want to know what is driving human behavior. We want to be able to um, understand sources of inequality, sources of unrest, sources of 
um, disease, you know, whatever it is. And, um, you know, these are the real challenges. And, and um, so, you know, that's just one example. I, I could have offered 20 more, you know, Twitter's recent announcement that it's opening up so much more of its data is really exciting to mm. me too, for example. But, you know, um, I'll be eager to hear what Matt says. Sure. So I want to pick up on a theme that Chris brought up, which is, um, I think, I think, you know, in the earlier days of computational social science, there was more just kind of figuring out what was possible, doing demonstrations, working on problems that were very motivated by academic concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly we're seeing a move towards people trying to take these same techniques or approaches and deploy them in the world in a way that's beneficial to the world and not detrimental to the world. So we've seen you know, attempts to use AI and machine learning to help improve social services, for example. Now this, raises lots of important questions, which are, in fact, the many of the things that you all will be discussing at Six Howard Mathematica. But I think mm -hmm. the movement of computational social science from the research community to the world, I think that is really the an exciting next direction. And how we can take the problems from the world and use those to fuel what's happening inside of computational social science. So I, I'm really excited about Six Hour Mathematica because I think you all have picked a great theme in in relation to what I think is an exciting future direction in the field. And and you know I, this this may be a, a basically the same question. I I, I hope it I hope it's not. But uh, what are the green shoots in computational social science? So what are the little areas of promise that are just peeking their heads out of the you know the dirt or the snow in the case of where I am in New Hampshire that we need to 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 water and 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 invest in. So uh, what are the things that are coming down the pike that maybe most other people don't see except. Uh, uh, it, it maybe I don't want to say except just the two of you, but hey, how about except just the two of you? <laughs> uh, well, I can say what I think we should invest in, and I think uh -huh. it's, we should invest in people and training people. Right? That the right now the overall impact that the ideas from computational social science are having inside of the academy and inside of society is much smaller than it should be, and it's much smaller than it could be. And so I think by giving these more people the skills that they need, just the experience, the way, new ways of thinking about the world, I think that once those skills and ideas are uh, more widely available, we'll see all kinds of flowering that none of us can even really anticipate. Yeah, and I think like the more we can get data into the hands of people who can analyze it, you know, like we one one of the real challenges as a field that that we're facing is, you know, a lot of the data we want to analyze is behind locked doors, you know. Mm. It's in governments, it's in so, it's in social media companies, and there's good reasons for that, right? That we we can't just have all the data as much as we'd like to. But I think that means we have to get even better, especially, you know, um senior people in the field at producing collective goods, you know, so there's a number of efforts afoot. Um, they might not be ready by this year, but I'm talking, you know, two or three years from now to, for example, link uh, social media data to survey data, you know, mm. or to um, create new kinds of online platforms where we could run some experiments much more cheaply. Um, or, you know, really, and th this is something I'm, I'm particularly passionate about, learning about the gaps in the digital data with qualitative methods, you know, um, you know, we tend to take the method, the, the data that we look at on social media as, you know, a, 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 as a good representation of what's happening in the world, right? But we all know that's not true. And figuring out how, um, you know, data is fitting into the lives of people um, is, is just enormously important right now. So, you know, we, we again, no shortage of questions, but, you know, thinking about um, creative ways of combining the little digital traces we can. Um, uh, and, you know, we hope that at six sites, there's some opportunities to seed research and to do, you know, it might be a little small pilot project, you know, but with a little bit of funding here and there, we've seen amazing things happen. So, you know, and, and certainly again, looking backwards for a minute when we were in, 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 in graduate school, you know, the idea of doing your own survey was pretty unfeasible because these were things that, you know, took tens of thousands of dollars to do. And now, you know, you know, we can we could talk about why some of the new alternatives aren't perfect, like Amazon Mechanical Turk, but they do offer mm -hmm. the ability to democratize access to data uh, in a way that we've we've never seen before. So these are exciting things. 
So, and I, 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 and I think you both know this about me. One of the things that I'm, I'm most excited about is, is in encouraging and, and, and seeding and growing as much diversity in this field as possible. Uh, and with that in mind, I'm hoping you'll, you'll talk a little bit about um, how we got to this point to, uh, to, to found the six at Howard, uh, Howard Mathematica, and uh, just about what excites you about our site in particular. Well, Lynette, I think you should tell us about how we got to this point of a six hundred <laughs> I mean, this is in some ways you, your story as well. Uh, so do you want to talk a little bit about why, yeah. why you're doing it? Ah, the interviewer is being interviewed. Oh, I see it. I see <laughs> how they able to turn. Flip, they flip that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so my understanding of the story uh, is that um, uh, Akira and Matt, uh, during the summer of 2019, had a conversation about the prolifer proliferation of partner sites, and Mathematica uh, suggested that they might want to, to host a site um, under, under the leadership of, of Akira, but also uh, the, uh, the head of Mathematica, Paul Decker. And um, and the conversation started uh, around doing it at, at a historically black university. And I'm not sure if it was around the same time or maybe a little late in the summer, but I think Matt, you and I had a conversation also, because of, of course I'm a, I'm a PhD student at Berkeley and one of the other members of the site that I was at that summer, I helped several people from that site helped to found the one at, uh, at Berkeley. But I had an excitement about uh, creating a site um, that we hadn't seen before that that sort of reached more uh, more broadly. And I, I think that's going to continue to be a passion of mine for a long time. I have some other ideas. Uh, so, um, so, so, and, and just that you were both so open to this idea and have just put not only um, your time, um, but but also resources as you've as you've come across them to help us do that. Uh, it shows me, and I think, our, and we'll show our participants again and again, just just how um, important diversity is. And then Matt, you and I also did that wonderful one-on-one uh, -on -one during the six uh, alumni festival last year too. That's right. That's right. Yes, I would encourage uh, if if people watching are interested in learning more about this specific topic or interested in seeing more about what six alumni are like, the kinds of things that they want to talk about. Last year we had an alumni festival uh, where people participated in these online uh, discussions. It's another way that we think about building the community, spotlighting the work from within the six community, making it more visible to others and giving everyone a chance to learn. And those videos are all archived so people can watch. I would particularly uh, recommend the video, uh, the conversation with Nanette I thought was very important and very timely given uh, everything else that was happening this past summer. Yeah, and you know, the other, the other tool I wanna invite people to check out is the database on our website. So if you go to the people page, you can um, search according to your interests. So if you are interested in, you know, uh, race and health, for example, type those search terms in and you may be surprised to see how many people there are in there. And, and we did this not just to, you know, brag about how great our program is, although we're, pre we're pretty proud of it, as you can tell, but, um, but also more importantly, to help build community, like Matt was saying. So, you know, help people make those lateral connections, you know, across universities, across fields that we think are really, really vital. And going forward, you know, this type of um, diversity um, you know, increasing it even further is definitely one of our chief goals. So I, I, I guess I just have uh, one more question for you, uh, for you both. Uh, and and if, if there are other things uh, we haven't covered, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome uh, you know, both of you taking the sort of the opportunity to fill any gaps uh, in that we may have missed. But I, I'd love to know what, uh, what you're working on right now that you're excited about. So uh, it's sort of an opportunity to humble brag about your, your research right now. <laughs> this is especially, th especially things you might want to co-author. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Here well, we go. I like, I, I don't know. When's the next book coming out, Matt? Chris has a book coming out. 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 Chris has a interested. I, I, so I run this thing at Duke called the Polarization Lab. And we are interested in, you know, kind of like fundamental questions about technology and social cohesion. So how can we design 
uh, social media to make it more um, to, to promote social cohesion instead of promoting incivility and all of the, you know, many negative things we've seen evolve since, you know, since over the past 10 years or so. And so we've done a lot of research over the last five years trying to look at how um, exposing people to opposing views, different types of people on uh, different types of people on social media platforms um, can can help to solve the problem. And some of our findings are a little counterintuitive, and we 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 had some growing pains along the way. But you know, in in this uh, past year, we've actually been able to create a social media platform for scientific research and pick people to use it. And one of the cool things about that is that we're able to then change the actual like inner architecture of the social media platform and see which parts promote cohesion and which ones promote incivility. And so um, I've been thinking a lot about that for the last year and, and just um, just finished up this new book called Breaking the Social Media Prism where I'm, where I'm talking about that research. And, um, you know, I think like just just knowing a little bit about the interests of your potential audience, I would say, you know, it's 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 really vitally important this question in the area of, of race and ethnicity. Um, you know, thinking about this is so clearly one of the biggest cleavages in our country, and um, you know, I think we're going to be writing about this for years, unfortunately. But you know, thinking about I was just on a, a call the other day with a, a with a social media company about exactly this issue. You know how. How can we redesign the platform um, to to make it a place that brings us together and not 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 pull us apart? And that, you know that's kind of a platitude. Um, you know now it's become vitally important. You know our our uh, you know our, our our safety, our well being, our health depend on it. So I'm hoping you know that that this type of research um, will inspire you know the next generation to to, to go even further with than we've been able to. Um, so I guess one thing that I'm really excited about now with my own research is um, trying to understand something that I already did. Uh, so mm -hmm. I recently did a, a scientific mass collaboration that involved hundreds of researchers around the world, and we were trying to measure the predictability of life outcomes. So given some data about someone, maybe some data about their parents, like let's say a kid given a bunch of data from birth to year nine, how well can we predict what will happen to them when they're 15 years old? And we had this large high quality social science data set and we had hundreds of researchers who were using state-of-the-art machine learning. And the main outcome of the research was that none of it worked well. So basically outcomes were very unpredictable, even with fancy machine learning, even with lots of data. And that's really surprising to me. So as we think about deploying AI and machine learning in high stakes social system, high stakes social decisions like criminal justice, like child protective services, there's been a lot of focus, rightly so, on questions of bias. But I think there is also a question about just overall accuracy. That is, if these things are just not that predictable, that will change, I think, how we think about whether these things should be used and how they should be used. And so I've become much more interested in trying to understand why it seems to be the case that things are so hard to predict. And that's led to some in-depth interviews with some kids and families to try to understand their lives better. And it's led to some more large-scale machine learning studies. And so uh, um, hopefully, I, you know, it took years to get that one result. And I think it will take many more years to actually understand that result. It's a good thing you're both young men and will be around with us for a very long time. <laughs> so I'd like to thank so you young. both. <laughs> well, that's just the pandemic talking. You're pandemic uh... time right now. So <laughs> I'd like to thank you both uh, for joining me today uh, and discussing thank you. six in its uh, in in its fifth year, what you've learned and, and thinking towards the future. Um, I am going to now put up a slide for our uh, attendees who are interested in learning more um, about six and also about six Howard Mathematica, the first location at historically black university. Uh, you'll see our website where you can head and join our email list. You'll also see our Twitter handle, our Facebook, and our email address. Uh, we are uh, accepting applications, and we hope to see one from you. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>